Okay. Um, yes. So, um, well, th this is the outline for now. So now I will introduce what Macmillan sport of algebra is. And um, you know, we're going to see, restrict ourselves to something that it, it's relative to a hyperplane arrangement. And we'll see that that thing has a modular structure over the this monoid that we introduced in the in the previous talk. Uh, and say something in the case of the permutahedron and the type B permutahedron. Okay. So let me introduce first the polytope algebra of Macmillan. Um, we're going to be working in RT, and this object is polytope algebra as a group is generated by classes of polytopes P. So we're going to denote them with brackets. And these classes satisfy two relations. Uh, the first one is this valuation relation right here. So whenever the union of two polytopes P and Q is again a polytope, which doesn't always happen, uh, then the class of the union plus the class of the intersection uh, is the same as the class of P plus the class of Q. Okay, so these are formal sums, just formal as a group. Uh, and the second relation that we want to impose is that the class of a polytope and any of its translates are the same. Okay, so this is what I meant before when I said that we were going to talk about polytopes modulo translations. So for us, they're going to be the same, the same class. Uh, and let me show you an sort of pretty and interesting identity that holds in this group as we have defined it. So let me denote by this triangle a two-dimensional simplex. And in this case, I want to think of this small one right here. So with side length one. Uh, and I want to convince you that this identity is true in this group. Okay, so here I have the class of three times the simplex. So that means dilate your simplex by a factor of three to get this triangle. And three copies of the class of the simplex, so these three right here, is the same as three copies of the second dilation of the simplex, so multiply by two, and a class of a point. Okay, and basically the idea here is that I can start moving things around because things are invariant under translation, and I can just put these things here and, and think of the multiplicity basically. So you can think, okay, this point right here, everything that is in a darker shade of gray has a multiplicity of two because it is on this triangle, but also on the big triangle, okay? And if I start moving things around here, so I push these big triangles to the center, I get the same, the same reasoning, right? These two are going to intersect over here. So in these triangles and a point here has multiplicity two because it corresponds to a point here and here. Okay, and the only thing that we have to be careful about is this uh, common intersection point. Uh, I claim that it has a multiplicity of four, and this is not very hard to see here. Uh, that point corresponds to the center of this big triangle, and also to one of the vertices of each of these smaller triangles on this side. And on the other side, it corresponds to this additional point that we have, and also to a point in the boundary of each of the other three triangles. So it also has a multiplicity of four. Okay, so this is one of those cute uh, identities that we can get if we play around with these with these relations right here. Uh, but okay, this is this is an algebra in particular. This is a ring. So what's the ring structure? Well, the ring structure is given by Mikowski sum. So what you were discussing in the in the pre talk, the product of two classes of polytopes uh, is the class of the Mikowski sum of the polytopes. Okay, so right away we already see that. Uh, this ring has a unit, and the unit is the class of any point, right? Because of this relation. And actually, the class of any point of any two points are the same, again, because of the same relation. Um, and another cute identity that we have with this product is that the nth power of a class of a polytope is just the class of the nth dilation of that polytope, right? At least when n is a positive integer. This makes sense. Um, okay. And I want to point out that the example that we did before has a very compact way now, because this is just saying that the class of the simplex minus one, so minus the class of a point, if I take that and I raise it to the third power, I get zero. If you start expanding things out, you, you realize that this is the same identity that we had before. So this class cubed, that's this, uh, minus three times this class squared, plus three times the class of the simplex minus one, that's zero. So these two identities are the same, okay? And it is no coincidence. This happens for every polytope. If I take uh, any polytope in, R, in, in, in RT uh, and I take the class of the polytope minus one, this is a nil potent element. So that means uh, there is a high enough power that I can raise it to so that, so that I get zero, okay? And we can be more precise. The power is precisely this. 
And this is nice because we can now define the logarithm of the class of a poly two, which seems like a weird thing to define, but it will be useful. Um, and we can define it just by using the usual power series of the logarithm, okay, centered at one. So because of this, because this, uh, when I raise it to a high enough power is zero, I can take the power series, but now it's going to be just a finite sum. So it's a well-defined element in this algebra. So sorry, um, I'm, I think I was writing, I missed, why is that power equal to zero? Could you repeat that again? Why is this equal to zero? Yes. Uh, it's, it's not so easy. It's something that you have to verify, but um, yeah, th this is just a, an example of why this is true, at least for a, for a, for a triangle. Um, but it is not trivial, I mean, it's not that easy to see, I guess. But it is true. Um, and with this, we can we can describe what's the, well, we can say a little bit more about the ring structure of, of this algebra. Uh, it is a graded ring, and the graded components, so this sub R here, the R graded component is generated as a group or uh, by, by these elements, the elements that are of the form, the, log, the logarithm of a polytope raised to the rth power, okay? Uh, in particular, the first graded component corresponds to all of the elements of this form, log of p, and linear combinations of those, okay? Uh, why- uh, Jose, wait, is the, can I ask something? Is the grading defined formally by this uh, sort of description, or is there a natural way to see it? Um, It is, I guess I want to define it formally for now. So if, yes, I, I want to define it formally. So I want to say this, this subspace, I define it to be generated by these elements. And then we have to check that this, this sum is actually a direct sum, which is not so trivial. So we have to check that whatever I can write as a linear combination of things that are of the form log to the three, I cannot write as a sum of log to the four of other things. So yeah, the, the, this theorem is, is a big result. It's not easy to, to check. There's a lot of things um, hidden behind this, this statement. Uh, but Thank you. What, I, what I wanna point out is that in degree one, things are very nice because uh, the usual properties of logarithm still hold. So for example, the logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms. But now if you remember the product of classes of polytopes is just the Mikowski sum. So what's happening now is that uh, sine Mikowski sums, so Mikowski sums with coefficients uh, become linear combinations in this space, okay? And linear combinations maybe are easier to deal with than sine Mikowski sums. And that's going to be uh, relevant at the end. Um, but okay, this is a, a huge ring. This has like too many generators, that's too much. Uh, we're going to restrict to something smaller. So we're going to fix a hyperplane arrangement and a sonotope of the arrangement. So remember uh, polytope that it's a Mikowski sum of segments, one orthogonal to each of the, of the hyperplanes of the arrangement. Um, and we're go going to consider the subring generated by the classes of the formations of the sonotope. Okay, so in this subring, we just have combinations, formal combinations of classes of the formations of the sonotope. Um, and the main result here is going to be that, uh, that this space, so this thing that it's a ring in itself, it also has the structure of a module over this other ring. So what, what is this ring, first of all? Uh, remember that we have defined the monoid of phases of an arrangement. This is just the monoid algebra. So I'm just adding coefficients and taking products by extending linearly uh, what we defined before. So I claim that there is a modular structure of this, uh, of this space as a module over the algebra associated to a hyperplane arrangement. Uh, how do I define a, a modular structure in this case? Well, I take an element here, so something that looks like the class of a deformation of the sonotope, and I need to tell you what the action of a phase of the arrangement is on this, uh, on this class, okay? That, that defines the modular structure. And I claim that this works. If I define the action of a phase F on a deformation Q to be the phase maximized in that direction. So just like before, uh, when we were maximizing in the direction of a vector, but now we can say we maximize in the direction of a phase of the arrangement. Um, 
that gives me a, mono, a modular structure, sorry. And this is going to be well-defined precisely because this is a deformation, right? Because this is a deformation. If I choose a phase of the arrangement, that's going to be contained precisely in one phase of the normal cone of Q. And I'm taking the corresponding phase of that deformation, okay? I'm not going to verify that uh, this is compatible with the product uh, here. So there are actions that we should verify to check that this is actually a, a module. Uh, I'm not going to do that here. Um, but I also want to claim that we have a little, a little bit, bit more. The action of every phase is actually an algebra endomorphism. So it's an amorphism of rings as well. And remember that here, the ring structure was the Mikoski sum. And this is going to imply that every graded component is a submodule of, of, this, of this module. So this decomposition into the direct sum, we can think of it as decomposition into the graded components of this as a ring. Uh, but it's also a decomposition of this module into smaller submodules. Okay. And now this might be a little bit weird, but um, as an algorist, if you have a module and you want to understand it better, maybe what you want to do is try to find, uh, try to write these, each of these submodules as a direct sum of simple modules or something like that. So these are the kind of things that you do whenever you have a module and you want to understand it a little bit better. Um, so let me make a parenthesis here and tell you that um, this algebra is actually pretty well studied for, for any hyperplane arrangement. And the modules are, the simple modules are, at least are very well understood. There's, they are one dimensional uh, and there's one isomorphism class for every flat of the arrangement, okay? Uh, if, yeah. Uh, and as I said before, ideally we would write each of these submodules that we have as a direct sum of simple modules, uh, but that is not always possible. So instead of doing that, we consider um, composition series of a module and we try to count what composition factors appear. Okay, so this is more like a, an algebraic, uh, a purely algebraic approach. Uh, we're just trying to find certain invariants that somehow describe these modules. Okay, and we can, we can then define uh, these invariants that are indexed. So this is what I wanna point out. We have these invariants that are indexed by flats of the arrangement because the flats of the arrangement uh, index the simple modules over this algebra. Uh, and this invariant denotes the number of composition factors on a composition series of this module that are isomorphic to that module indexed by X. So without, this we can take it as a big parenthesis. And the important thing is that because this is a module over this algebra, there are certain algebraic invariants that are important to compute, okay? That are interesting to compute just from the algebraic point of view. And this proposition tells us uh, there are formulas to do so. If you have enough information, if you know the Mobius function of your arrangement, and if you know the dimensions of certain subspaces, you have enough information to compute these invariants. Okay, I will go back and, and say why well, one, one reason why these invariants tell, tell us interesting things about the deformations of a sonotope, uh, but for now, let me leave that open. Um, and let me go to a specific case. So I wanna consider this, this, uh, this module in two particular cases. Uh, the one where my arrangement is the braid arrangement and the corresponding sonotope is the permutahedron and the other cases where my arrangement is the Coxeter arrangement of type B and the sonotope is the type B permutahedron, okay? So let me review what these polytopes are. Uh, the permutahedron in RT is the polytope that, such that the, the vertices are all of the permutations or the points that I get with all the permutations of the numbers one through D. So here in R3, we take the point one, two, and three, and we, sorry, the points with coordinates one, two, and three, and we take all possible permutations of those entries. And then we have these six points over here, and when we take the convex envelope, we get this regular hexagon right here. Um, and remember, this is a picture in R3. Uh, and that's the, that's the polytope, sorry, that's the permutahedron in R3. So this description right here is saying, take the points with coordinates one to D and act in every possible way uh, with the elements of the symmetric group, okay? So just permuting the coordinates. 
And the type B permutation string is something similar, but now I act with a different group, a bigger group, uh, the group of signed permutations. So I'm allowed to permute the coordinates, by, but also I'm allowed to add negative signs if I want. Okay, so here I have uh, all of the permutations of this point one and two, but also I can add negative signs uh, on different entries. So now I have something that is bigger, okay? Uh, and in R3, I already have something that is full dimensional. And this corresponds to all the same permutations of the point one, two, one comma two comma three, okay? I wanna point out, I mean, as, a, as an interesting thing, of course, uh, the type A permutahedron is always a face of the corresponding type B permutahedron, right? Because yeah, I have the usual permutations plus all of the ones that have a negative sign over there. So this is always a phase of this point. Okay. Um, okay, sorry, and I should point out, and there is a hyperplane arrangement corresponding to this polytube. The, I am describing this somehow uh, for now, just as the convex envelope of these permutations, but these polytubes are actually sonotubes and the corresponding hyper, hyperplane arrangement uh, are the type A and type B coxeter arrangements. In type A, we just have all of the hyperplanes of the form xi equals xj. Uh, so we have x1 equals x2, um, x2 equals, equals x3, and x1 equals x3 right here. Uh, and in type B, we have those hyperplanes, so xi equals xj. We also have the ones of the form xi equals negative xj. So just like here, we have x1 equals negative, negative x2. And we also have all the coordinate hyperplanes, okay? So these are sonotopes associated to these very particular hyperplane arrangements, okay? Um, and this word, so generalized permutahedra, just means a polytope that it's a deformation of the permutahedron. So the formation as we had before, the normal fan of the permutahedron, so the faces of the corresponding coxeter arrangement, uh, refine the normal fan of the polytubes, okay? A particular and important example here uh, is the standard simplex. The standard simplex is always a permit, uh, sorry, a deformation of the permutahedron, okay? And another interesting interesting example is the, the cross polytube. So the cross polytube is the one whose vertices are all of the points of the form plus or minus a canonical basis vector. So E1 and negative E1, E2 and negative E2, E3 and negative E3. Uh, that one is a deformation of the type B permutahedron, but not of the type A permutahedron, okay? So these are just examples of these deformations. Sorry, what is not a deformation of the type A permutahedron? What is not? Um, yeah. the, the cross polytube. Cross polytube, it's a deformation of the type B permutahedron, but not of the type A permutahedron. But the other way around, every generalized permutahedron is a generalized type B permutahedron. Okay. Okay. So let's let's try to compute these uh, these invariants, the, these things that we had in the in the previous slide. So we had these invariants, and we had some quote unquote closed formula for these invariants uh, that again just depend on the Mobius function of the hyperplane arrangement which for these cases are known. Uh, they're not very, very hard to describe. Uh, and on the dimensions of these spaces, okay? So these are a little bit weird, uh, but let's see, how can we compute these things? Well, one important result in this regard is by Macmillan, when he introduced these spaces. And he, he showed that whenever you have a simple polytube, so that means uh, that at every vertex, you have the, facets adjacent to that vertex, where it is the dimension of the polytube, okay? And that happens for all coxeter permutahedra, so for type A or type B or even other types, that happens. Um, so these are simple polytopes and actually every face of a simple polytope is simple. Uh, and in that case, McQueen showed that the dimension of these spaces were determined by the H numbers of the polytube, okay? So the key point here is that, okay, we, know what these numbers are, okay? Or sorry, at least we know that these dimensions are the H numbers of the corresponding polytube that appears here. That's the first ingredient. The second ingredient here, uh, which is, was done in general by Brenty, is that the H polynomial, so basically these H numbers uh, for all coxeter permutahedron 
are determined by the corresponding Eulerian, poly Eulerian polynomial. So the, there is this polynomial that it's called the W Eulerian polynomial for every Coxeter group W uh, that keeps track of certain statistic on, on the elements of the Coxeter group. And let me be explicit of how this looks like in type A. So in type A, we have the classical Eulerian, Eulerian polynomials. Um, and this is one possible description of these Eulerian polynomials. They keep track of the number of exceedances on the permutations uh, on the elements. So what's an exceedance, first of all? So let me write this down. Um, an exceedance, so let me say I. Oops. This is an exceedance of a permutation sigma uh, if when I apply sigma to i, I get something strictly bigger than i. Okay, so that's what a, an exceedance of a permutation is. And here I'm just keeping track of all of the exceedances. Um, sorry, oh yeah, of, of the exceedances among all, all of the permutations of uh, of the elements. Okay, this is one possible description of, of this Eulerian polynomial. And the result here is okay. Using all of this information, we can compute this invariance. Um, and they have a very combinatorial interpretation. They are, once I fix R, so the graded component, the degree, and R flat X, they are counting all the permutations that have exactly R exceedances, where that's the degree, and such that when they act on RD, because these elements permute the coordinates of RD, right? So they act on RD, the collection of fixed points by the action of this element is precisely the flat X that I have here, okay? So the, the, the point here is there is a, a concrete uh, description of, of these invariants. Okay, and it just depends on something that is very combinatorial. Okay. There is our similar result uh, in type B, but now in type B, we have the type B Eulerian polynomial. It's, it looks uh, a little bit different. We have a different, a different um, statistic, uh, but it involves exceedances, which is the same thing that I described before. It's just any positive integer that when I apply the permutation goes to something bigger, uh, but it also involves negations. And a negation is just a positive integer that when I apply the sign permutation goes to something negative. That's a negation, okay? So again, it depends on certain statistic. It is, it definitely looks more involved. It's kind of weird to have this division by two and this taking the integer part of that, uh, but it turns out that it, it, it works. Uh, so basically, okay, this is, not, this is not me, but it is shown that this weird statistic that I have written down here has the same distribution as the descents in the type B sense. So that's why this is an equivalent description of the type B Eulerian polynomial, uh, but somehow following the same recipe as before, uh, we find a result that is very similar. Okay, we also say, okay, uh, we, can, we can compute this invariance uh, and they are again of combinatorial meaning and they are counting certain sign permutations according to this statistic and according to the collection of points that they fix when they act on RT. Okay, so it's very similarly looking. Um, okay, but now, Let's, let's use this information somehow. Well, this one, maybe uh, it's a little less related to what we have discussed before. Uh, the proofs of these theorems involve manipulating power series a lot. So it is actually hard to do it for just one sonotope. Uh, it's easier to do it for all of them at once and just use power series and a lot of manipulation, and checking that the coefficients agree and things like that. Uh, and I'm sorry, Jose, can I can I stop you for a minute to ask something? Yeah. Like in the in the previous slide, uh, am I correct that when you're using this X notation, this is a version of the cycle type, right? So for the symmetric group, X would correspond to a cycle type, or do we have a finer version of that? Uh, no, it's it's not it's not just a cycle type. Uh, so this is again so a, a sign permutation is a permutation of the set plus minus D. Right, where plus minus D means I have the elements one through D and they're negatives. And it's a permutation mm -hmm. that satisfies certain property, right? That if I take the permutation of minus I, that's the same as minus the permutation of I. Uh, 
an, an exceedance is just like before, uh, an exceedance is a, a positive entry such that tau of i is bigger than i. So it's not directly related to the cycle type. What it is somehow related to cycle type is this, uh, this statistic right here. So as I was saying, manipulating the proof a little bit, uh, we, can, we can get certain, uh, certain expressions for the generating function of certain bivariate polynomials that keep track of two different statistics as, at, one, at once, sorry. In type A, this statistic is well, the exceedance that I described. And this one, so the dimension of the fixed space, this is, as you were mentioning, this is just the number of cycles in the cycle decomposition of the permutation. So even though it looks weird, this is just counting the number of cycles. And this, this ha had been done before. Okay, so this was already done by Brenty before. Uh, but in type B, if we count the, the dimension of these flats, uh, it seems to be related to the cycle decomposition in type B, but it's not quite the same. We have, we have to be careful. So I haven't found anything that uh, considers these two statistics at once. So this uh, index sub B here is, instead of writing all of this again, I just called it XCN sub B. Uh, but yeah, th this is one corollary of the proofs. It's just, again, using all of these power series stuff and getting these new formulas for, for this new or possibly new bivariate polynomial. Uh, but let's go to another corollary that is more, more geometric and more related with what we were discussing uh, in the pre-seminar, pre okay? So there is this very nice result uh, that I think we're already ready to understand what it means. The result is this, every generalized permutahedron in RP, so the formation of the permutahedron, can be written uniquely as a sine Mikowski sum of the faces of the standard simplex, okay? So what does this mean? Well, let, let me show you this picture. Um, and let's consider the case in, uh, in R3. So in R3, the, the, the permutahedron has dimension two. Uh, we discussed how sine Mikowski sums correspond to linear combinations in this space, right? And inside of this space, I have all of the elements that are of the form log of, a, of an honest polytope, right? But I can also have things that are differences of these things. And they don't necessarily represent a polytube. Just like before, Mikowski difference not always represent an honest polytube. Uh, but in any case, the, the space of all the things that are log of a polytube inside of here are a cone. So that means that if I take any non-negative linear combination of those, I get another polytube. Because if I take honest Mikowski sum of, of the formations of, of the polyhedron, of the permutahedron, sorry, I get another the formation of the perimeter here. Uh, and the picture that I have here is that cone, which is actually four dimensional. Uh, and I'm cutting it with a hyperplane. I'm just taking a slice of that so that we can all see how it looks like. And, and the picture that we get is like this. So it is a four dimensional cone uh, that has five rays. So it's something that lives in a four dimensional space. It has five rays that it's generating this cone. And this is how it looks like. Uh, these extremal points right here are the rays of that, of that cone. And this result is saying, okay, you have many rays, in this case five, but they grow very fast, exponentially fast, I believe. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You can, there, you can choose this one, so the one associated with the simplex and their faces. So in this case, we only have four. And even though there are not all of the rays of the cone, uh, if you're allowed to take also positive and negative combinations, they span all of the cone. They, they actually span all of the space. So they form a basis for the, a linear basis for the ambient space where they live. And this, this result is telling you precisely that. So these uh, are a finally independent. And they, in this case, if you take the convex hull of these four points, it's something full dimensional. Um, but this uniquely means they are linearly independent, right? It's the minimum number that I need so that I get something that is full dimensional here. And a nice question is, okay, what's a nice type B analog of this result? And in some sense, in some sense, uh, it seems that the, the, maybe the result is, okay, take the, the cross polytube and do the same. It doesn't work 
if we take the conf point of and all of its faces, we just generate something of the dimension of half the dimension that we expect. Okay, because if you look at opposite faces, that look they all look like generalized permutahedra. So they are generating the same space. So let, let me maybe go quickly here and tell you that uh, this invariance that we compute. Actually, there is a way to, to use the, the numerical information in this invariance uh, to conclude that if we're going to have a family like this that generates permutahedra, but in type B, we're going to need at least two to the D minus one that are full dimensional. And that information comes from one of these invariants. Okay. And maybe instead of, uh, there, there is some manipulation that you have to do with, so, with the structure of, of a module uh, there, but maybe let me finish. Uh, with one construction where you get precisely two to the D minus one and no more full dimensional ones. And it still uses the cross polytope, but we're gonna do a different manipulation. What we're going to do now is slice the cross polytope with all of the coordinate hyperplanes. Uh, if, I, if I take each orthant and the intersection of the orthant with the cross polytope, I have a full dimensional simplex. So I have two to the D many of these simplices and I'm taking those and all of their faces. So those are too many. I have twice as many as I as I want as I want. Um, and here I'm giving a a clever way to pick half of them so that they are linearly independent in this cone of the formations. If I pick half of them at random, it, they're not going to be linearly independent. Uh, but here I'm saying, okay, there there is a, a a way that you can pick them so that they are linearly independent. And I guess, sorry, I'm going a little bit over time, but. That I want to finish. So thank you.